Okay, good evening. I, the water came back on enough for me to get my, my mornings and evenings correct as opposed to yesterday. Um, so we'll start off with the, uh, well, we'll start off with a word of prayer and then we'll go into Q&A. But just a quick note before I do that, if anybody doesn't have any, there is uh, handouts in the back that have all the slides on it so you can make notes. And then again, we've got the end time chart. And then the back has all the different references and things of that nature. So if you want one of those, feel free to, to get one. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your wonderful blessings. Thank you for allowing us, the, again, the privilege to come together. Uh, Lord, I just ask that you speak through me, not my words, but your words, Lord. Open our hearts. Let, you, let us let you in so that we may join you in paradise in heaven, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we had a few questions uh, yesterday, and so I wanted to hit these really quick. It says, uh, the first question was related to, is this uh, COVID and the riots and things that we've seen, the upheavals and, uh, that we've seen tie into the end time events? And so the answer is, uh, the short answer is yes, and we don't know. So you have to, when you look at the time of the end, there's different times that you're talking about. It depends on what you mean by time of the end. So biblically speaking, the time of the end began, the first time it mentions the time of the end, it began in 1798. Okay, so from 1798 forward, we're living in the time of the end. So having the different things that are, for example, mentioned in Matthew uh, uh, and, and these other distra- uh, destruction things going on, things of that nature, we are living in that time period. So yes, it is a fulfillment of those things. But I believe what the question was more leaning towards is at some point in the future, there is going to be, I don't know if you want to call it a line or a marker where really bad things start to happen and it's kind of a hockey stick up where you just have a lot of destruction, a lot of things going on in the world. Um, And the answer to that is we don't know. Um, There's no way to know which disaster, you know, if I pick on COVID, for example, what's different about this than other diseases and pandemics that have happened and a lot of them have been way worse, like the Spanish flu, which killed a lot of people, much big percentage of the population of the earth. Um, So you have trouble with that. And so it's hard to, as someone who wants God to come, and we'll talk about a little bit more of this once we get started, but as someone who wants God to come, oftentimes we will grab a current event and put it into the Bible. That's the temptation because we really want God to come. So we have to be a little careful of that. It's okay to say it's a possible sign of the end, but it's also something that we want to be um, cautious of, of having, saying that this exact event equals the beginning of the end of things. And we'll get into a little bit more reason why not to do that. Okay, Uh, the second question is... Will God be performing miracles at the same time that Satan is when we were talking about the la- uh, last night's presentation about the false ladder rain? So the, the original quote where we got that from said that before the actual outpouring, Satan is going to try to circumvent it by having this false one. So the very definition of that is that there is a, he is going to be starting his stuff first. Um, Does that mean that it's completely without miracles on God's side? No, but the bulk of the things that are going on at that time are going to be manifested by spiritualism. And let me see here. This is Selected Messages, uh, book two, and this is on page 48. 
it says that Satan will work in the most subtle wet manner to introduce human inventions clothed with angels' garment. In other words, taking things that are false and making it sound good. <clears throat> but the light of the world, or the light from the world, word, is shining amid the moral darkness. The Bible will never be superseded by miraculous manifestations. The truth must be studied. It must be searched as for hidden treasure. Wonderful illusions will not be given aside from the word or to take the place of it. Cling to the word, receive the engrafted word, which will make men wise unto salvation. This is the meaning of the words of Christ in regard to eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he says, this is eternal, that they might know uh, they that they might know the and the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So, and then, and then the whole chapter there. It's chapter five, by the way. The whole chapter there is dealing with miracles and and all of this and setting that stage. So, does it mean that God's not going to do anything for His people? I don't think so. But we are not at that time or any time really, going to utilize miracles to prove the point. And she actually says that. God never worked in that way. We're not going to work that way where we're going to use miracles to kind of show. It's not going to be this, I almost want to say a contest between who can have the bigger miracles. That's not what's going to happen. Now, it also does say that the closing work is not going to go out or going to end less than it began. So at some point when that latter rain is poured out, those miracles will be Wrought, and it will be in a very special way, but it will also be in a way that praises God and glorifies God, rather than more than likely these, which will be very public, very out there to try to draw people in. You know, there's a big difference in how it's done as well. Okay, uh, the last question that we'll cover is, can Satan heal people who he didn't make sick? So we talked about how Satan sometimes in the last meeting Satan will put on uh, and make someone be sick, and then he will remove that from them, and they will think that it's well. The answer to that is yes. He can do both of those things. He's going to be working real miracles, but he's also going to be forging miracles as well. He'll do anything and everything he can get to confuse us. Uh, Great Controversy 553 says this, And the Apostle John, describing the miracle-working power that will be manifested in the last days, declares, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. No mere impostors he are here foretold. Men are deceived by miracles which Satan's agents have the power to do, not which they pretend to do. So while, yes, Satan will run a, a muck with people uh, by doing other things that he can't do, he will also work real miracles that cannot possibly be denied. Matter of fact, one of the, another quote that she talks about is she talks about people that, that actually do not have faith in any of these things. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in any of these things. And she says when those people are confronted by actual miracles that they cannot deny, it sweeps them in completely because they, 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 they denied that it exists, but once they see it and it actually hits them that there's no way you can fake this, that it just falls into place. And that, to me, that, that sounds a lot like um, atheists and things of that nature that don't believe in God. They don't believe in the supernatural. But when they're confronted with these things head on, they'll have no choice but to completely set aside what they held as true and fall right into it. And that's going to be the issue. Okay, so for tonight, we're going to be and this is not a, a Bible study where we're walking through how we get that there is a Sunday law. We're looking at this at the time scope of things. Where does the Sunday law fall? So there's an assumption here that you know about this. So bear that in mind. The Sunday law, though, also is one of the subjects that I have a, I guess I would call a love-hate relationship with. It is really interesting. It is fascinating to look about, uh, to learn about, a spe- well, all the end time stuff is. But the thing that I have a frustration with is that 
a lot of times, different people, we will take things a little too far in how we talk about the Sunday law. So, for example, there's been many false predictions inside the church about the Sunday law. It happened in Ellen White's time. It happens throughout, basically, Adventist history. And a big part of that is really sincere, and kind of goes back to the original verse question, really sincere Christians want God to come soon. They don't want to wait on this earth any longer. So what they do is they look at things that are going on in the world that kind of fit what we know is going to happen, and they grab that event and put it into the context of the end time, which is fine to a certain extent. But there is a danger between, again, saying, is this event is the start versus this could be. This is something that ties into what we know is happening at the end time events. So let's look at some of these. JFK was going to bring about the Sunday law. Some of you may remember this depending on age, but JFK was going to bring in the Sunday law because he was the first Catholic president. This was a huge deal. Obviously, JFK came, went, um, this had nothing, didn't do anything, was not relevant. Jimmy Carter was going to start the Sunday law because he was an evangelist, he was an evangelical Christian. He was actually a Christian. Like the, the press uh, used to make fun of him because he wouldn't serve alcohol at his White House parties and things of that nature. So this was a big deal. People were, they were going to be a Sunday law. It was going to be him because he was an evangelical Christian. Now, this one I was old enough to remember as a child hearing, hearing preachers talk about this. Ronald Reagan establishing diplomatic relations with the Vatican. That was going to be the Sunday law. That was going to start the Sunday law. And these events have come and gone, and while they are interesting, they did not, and they did not lead to a Sunday law um, as people had thought, and what I mean by that is in a narrow time period. They're, they're thinking, okay, this person's coming in, and this, because what this really is, a lot of this is, is time setting. You're not setting a date, but you kind of are. You know, if JFK, I'll pick on JFK, if JFK is going to bring about the Sunday law, what am I in inherently saying? During his presidency, while he's in office, which is a time, this all stuff is going to begin. And, and God warns us against those things. We, it's, it's hard to put that exactly in, when, especially when it's not something that's directly in the Bible that we know is specifically going to happen. So we have that. And we have these things happening today. We have movements within climate change pushing for a rest day on the earth. There's actually a website dedicated to trying to get a day off uh, on the planet, for the planet. And uh, this has happened I don't, I don't, lots of different times. But recently, again, the Pope has called for a day of rest uh, for the planet. Um, and it's no shock that he wants it to be Sunday. Um, so these are also things that people are speculating. Is this part of it? And it can be. But the, question, the difference is is saying this could be versus this is, a direct link. Because we can often leave, lead fellow believers a little bit astray with this. Uh, for example, what happens with the Sunday law? Oh. It creates an energy and buzz. Ultimately, there's a letdown. And as these people hear these things, because people will take these ideas and they run with them a lot of times, they begin to get callous to other warnings. And you've seen that maybe in your own life if you've been around people that, that build up to this. And then ultimately speaking, what can happen is the people walk away. And I was actually, when I first started studying a lot of this stuff, um, I was talked to a friend of mine. I called a friend of mine up and I was like, hey, let me run this stuff by you because some of the stuff I'm finding, these quotes, don't completely add up with a lot of the things that I've heard, different ideas of timelines and things of that nature, you know, put, put out there. And so I was like, can you just, let me run some of this through. And I went through some of it and we talked about it. But then he told me a story um, because we were talking about someone else kind of given an idea of when God was going to come. And he said, let me tell you about what happened to me. He said, when I was a baby... My parents were into one of these uh, ideas of when the Sunday, some event was going to cause the Sunday law, that one of those different ones. And they, his parents, along with 
uh, several other group of Adventists went in together and bought some land out in the middle of nowhere to know, ride through the end of time because the Sunday law is coming. We don't want to be around all the wicked and all these disasters and things that are coming and things of that nature. Well, what ultimately happened is nothing happened. And every one of those people, save his parents, thankfully, but every one of those people that were involved in it all left the faith. Now, uh, that does not mean that they don't bear, those people that left, responsibility for their own actions, right? You are responsible for your own relationship with God. You can't lay it off on somebody putting out an idea or a thought. But as we don't want to make our other brother stumble, as Paul kind of related in the Bible talking about food offered to idols, he says, well, I know it's nothing, but because of that, I don't want to make my brother stumble. We need to be careful of those links when we are absolutely saying this is going to lead to this because that just becomes problematic because it can wind up driving some of our people that are maybe a little weaker in the faith out of the church because they get callous to these warnings. But having said all of that, the Sunday law is extremely important to look at. And let's look at some of the reasons why. It says in the Bible, it says, this is Revelation 13, 13 through 17, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast would both speak and cause that as many who had not worshipped the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no man may buy or sell, save he had that mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So this is where the Bible is talking about the Sunday law. But notice, there's lots of things that are important. One, the world being deceived by miracles. We've talked about that, and we've, we've gone through that. But there's also... Uh, that if we, don't, if we don't follow this beast, we're going to be ultimately wanting, they're going to want to kill you. And then, of course, you have the no buy, no sell. But probably the most important aspect of this Sunday law is the mark of the beast. If you get a mark on the right hand or the forehead, those, those things are where you are, your salvation is actually at stake. And, of course, just to point out, everybody receives a mark. You're either going to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. So everyone's getting marked. It's just a de determining on whose mark are you going to accept. Review and Herald, so, uh, this is uh, 1766, says, the people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full. And national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy is national ruin. So another massive reason to study this is right here. The result of this Sunday law is national ruin. Now, I don't know how many people here like history. I like history. That was always, always seemed like just storytelling to me. And I've read lots of times when countries have fallen apart and gone, you know, gone under and things of that nature. And they're never peaceful. They're never safe. They always seem bloody. They always seem messy. It's always a very dangerous time for people to live in. And this is the exact result of the Sunday law. National ruin will be coming upon this country. So this is something that we really want to understand and be aware of because this is an extremely dangerous time. This will be an extremely dangerous time to live. Great Controversy 605. The observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to the power that is in opposition to God. Keeping the, sab the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator, while one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receives the seal of God. Now, this just affirms what we read in Revelation, right? 
you're going to have a seal based on this Sunday law. At the end of time, that's going to be the main test. And depending upon how you respond to that test, will determine saved, not saved. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to come down to will you serve God's law in spite of what man dictates to us. Okay, uh, this is uh, Maranatha, page 197, says, Friends will prove treacherous and will betray us. Relatives deceived by the enemy will think they do God's service in opposing us and putting forth the utmost efforts to bring us into hard places, hoping we will deny our faith. But we may trust our hand in the hand of Christ amid darkness and peril. So notice what they're saying here. This, this event is going to make friends and relatives betray you. And, and actually, it goes a step further. It says they actually think they're doing God's service by putting you in difficult paths and making it hard for you and making you want to give up your faith. Well, this is a big reason to understand how this happens and what is this, what's going on. So this is a big deal. Uh, again, Review and Herald says, those who apostatize at the time of trial will bear false witness and betray their brethren to secure their own safety. They will tell where their brethren are concealed, putting the wolves on their track. Christ has warned us of this, that we may not be surprised at the cruel, unnatural course pursued by friends and relatives. Um, another example of the types of things that friends and family will do to you. And it also really, to me, the thing that pops into my head when I read this the first time was this really blows up the idea of prepping your way through the end of time. Because what do pe people always do when they have that mindset? They go out and they buy this land and they bring all this stuff in there and they set everything up and then what do they do? They go and they tell their friends and family, when this stuff starts, don't tell anyone, but come up here because I'm ready for it. Well, guess who's the ones that are betraying them? Well, they're friends and family. They're actually going to be setting up. So you can't prep your way out of the end of time. This is something that's going to happen. It is literally going to drive a wedge between everyone that is righteous and the wicked. There's going to be a separating. And that unfortunately means that many families will be separated. Many friendships will be broken. And these things will happen because of that separation. The pressure will be applied and people will have to decide what's going on. And think about the pressure. I mean, before we go any further, what are the things we've all talked about already? Because we don't want to just silo this as one event. We've got massive destruction taking place before the, before the Sunday law, and we have massive spiritualism. It's forcing you to pick a side. There will come a time when because of our advocacy of Bible truth, we will be treated or shall be treated as traitors. That's Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 394. And think about that for a second. Think and let that sink in about how you'll be treated. The best I can come up with in my own mind, because we haven't experienced that a lot in our country, at least at this point, where there's not basically two sides to things, is 9-11, right? When we had people that did an act of, of war against the country, killed a lot of innocent people, and the country rose up in anger, basically. And I will never forget it. I will never forget Bush, uh, President Bush talking about it and saying, whoever did this, we will find you. And if you are connected with any country, we will come after you too. And I, I never will forget the response of the countries because in politics, there's always this side and that side, and they always try to antagonize each other, these different governments and things. But when that happened... Every government around the world, regardless of whether or not they're very particularly friendly with the United States or not, came out and said, oh, we had nothing to do with this. They did not want to face the wrath of the nation. And that's exactly what's going to happen to us as we become those traitors. Obviously, a lot of those people, they weren't citizens, but you get the idea. You're betraying your country. You are betraying humanity at this point, and 
that is going to have a big impact on how you are treated. Great Controversy 608, as defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, and some of them will be treated as slaves. So slavery will make a comeback. So the righteous who follow, they're going to be put in, uh, there's a couple quotes ago, difficult places. Well, prison, exiled, slavery, that sounds an awful lot like difficult places, doesn't it? And it should be solemn to think about that this will actually happen, but it will. A matter of fact, one of the things that she talks about is she says, you know, the great controversy, which has had a lot of impact on a lot of people's lives, she said the impact that it's had thus far is very, very minimal compared to the impact that it will have when these things start to come true. So when these end-time events actually start to take place, and this is one of the things, you know, we never, I, I didn't really think of until I read that, is, you know, a lot of times you talk about, oh, I'm going to show them the Bible. But imagine taking out the great controversy and showing them a little clear language. Hey, look at, what's, look at what, what was predicted, and here's what happened. That impact on people cannot be underestimated. Great controversy uh, 589. While appearing to the children of men as the great physician who can heal all their maladies... He will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. It will be declared that men are offending God by violation of the Sunday Sabbath. This sin, and that this sin has brought the calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration and divine favor and temporal prosperity. So we've read this before. And you'll have to forgive me because you're going to read extra stuff because it's bare repeating on these because they're pertinent to the subject. Is all of these disease, all these disasters, and specifically he talks about disease and disaster, populous cities. So again, a focus on the cities because of violation of Sunday Sabbath, uh, and that's going to cause this issue. So this is something that's going to transpire, and a lot of it's going to be blamed because of the disasters that are out there. Storm and tempest, war and bloodshed, and these things he delights. And thus he gathers in his harvest. And so completely will men be deceived by him that they will declare that these calamities are the result of desecration of the first day of the week. From the pulpits of the popular churches will be heard the statement that the world is being punished because Sunday is not honored as it should be. And it will require no great stretch of the imagination for men to believe this. They are guided by the enemy. Therefore, they reach conclusions that are entirely false. So again... We have that same thought process, except we have the addition of natural disasters, man-made disasters, wars, and all of these things are going to be declared to be the, the fault of those people who are refusing to honor Sunday. And again, the reason why the world is so thought on that, or are bent on that thought process, is because they are guided by the enemy. Satan has has deluded them at this point. Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week. Pleading tradition and custom on behalf of this man-made institution, they will point to the calamities on land and the sea, to the storms of wind, the floods, the earthquakes, the destruction by fire as judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. So again, we have emphasize lots of destruction going on because Sunday is not observed, and it's lots of different kinds of things. So before we can start to place and say, okay, this is the lead up, we need to see a cadence happening, right? We need to see a lot of different things happening in the world. Satan puts his interpretations on events, and they think, as he would have them, that the calamities which fill the land are the result of Sunday breaking. Thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing Sunday observance. So again, the Sunday observance comes because of all of the calamities which fill the land. And fill means everywhere, all over the place. In accidents and calamities by sea, by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, terrific hailstones, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest 
and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the law of God, changed the ordinance, broke the everlasting covenant. That's Great Controversy, page 589, uh, 590. I want to drive in the point. The reason why you're seeing this repeated over and over is to really make it clear these things are what drive and motivate. It's pouring gasoline on the earth, right? You're just getting a lot of things. When these disasters happen, and you see what happens to today, right? We've got the virus thing that happened. What happened in the world when the virus first came out? All of a sudden, everything shuts down. You can't go to church. You can't do this. You can't do that. People are very much willing to give up rights for safety. And that's over this unknown. Imagine what happens when, I don't even want to read it all, but all these type of things happen at the end. And they think it's the fault of a group. And they think it's because Sunday is not sacredly observed. How will things transpire? How will we be treated during that time period? As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country around the globe will be led to follow her example. This is Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 18. So what this is telling us is the Sunday law will happen here first. The world will follow our example, the nation's example, in instituting the Sunday law. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought the calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance is strictly enforced, and that those who persist in the claims of the fourth commandment are thus destroying reverence for Sunday and are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temple prosperity. I think I did that one already. Um, so again, that repeating of these things are going to be a big deal. They're going to be blamed on us. Uh, did I, did this go back a page? Um, bu- 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 yeah, okay, no, no, I'm sorry, I know. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as the benefactor of the race, healing the disease of the people and professing to present a new, more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as the destroyer. So now we're seeing again those two markers that we've seen, spiritualism and uh and he's exalting a new religious system. So what we're going to see at some point is a blending of things, and we know what that is. We've read it already before. You've got spiritualism merging with Protestantism, merging with Catholicism, creating this environment. And that's what's going to happen. But Satan is going to try to present a new, more exalted system. So he's stepping into the realm to try to draw everyone together. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. The voice with voice and pen, by boast, threat, ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people. Not having a thus saith the Lord to bring against the advocates of Bible truth or the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. To secure popularity and patronage, the legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. This is Testimonies Church, Volume 5, 450, 451. So, whose idea is the Sunday law? It's people's. It's the people. It's a popular thought process that's coming. It's not a top-down, some sneaky president comes in and writes some executive order, and poof, there's a Sunday law. 
That's not what happens. It is people, it is popular amongst the people. Matter of fact, and it's not in this presentation, um, it's in the back of the, the, uh, the chart, but there's a couple quotes um, uh, that Ellen White talks about where it says that uh, it indicates that there will, may, will be a change to the Constitution, which if you un understand the government and how all that works, changing a Constitution is very, very difficult. It has to be an overwhelming majority to be able to do that. And so this is going to be a massively popular thing to do. So we know there's massive disasters. We know all these things. We know how they treat us. We need to find out what's the match. What is the thing that really sets off the Sunday law? This is Great Controversy, page 624. As the crowning act of the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look for the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now, the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth. Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation. In his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hollow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with truth and light. So this is a quote in the Great Controversy talking about when Satan fakes Christ's coming. And we're not talking about that right yet. That's not the point of this particular quote. What I want to zero in on is that last uh, couple sentences here. He says that he changed the Sabbath to Sunday, but, but why does he think that the people that say no are blaspheming his name? Why does he think that they're blaspheming his name at the time when he does this? It's because why? Is it because they didn't read their Bible? Is it because they didn't listen to the minister that told them? Is it because they didn't listen to their neighbor? No. It says they refused to listen to his angels sent to them with truth and light. So there's something important there, and it's that word sent, meaning this happened previously. So before this event occurs, Satan sends out angels to the people with truth and light. And that made me wonder, well, I mean, I know that they're demons and things, but who are these angels and how are they sending out this message of truth and light? How can we identify these angels? This is Signs of the Times, August 26, 1889. It is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion, one calculated to take hold of the sympathies of those who have laid their loved ones in the grave. Evil angels come in the form of loved ones who relate incidences connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be deceased friends are regarded with a certain idolatry and with many their word has a greater weight than the word of God. We read that actually yesterday, but I don't know if you caught the angel thing yesterday. It ties into this because that's who the definition of those angels are. It's evil angels impersonating relatives, loved ones. And it says that obviously their word has greater weight than the word of God. Now think about this again in the context of what we've been talking about. Massive destruction taking place. What happens when you have massive destruction? Death, right? Now, some of these people that have died, probably fairly recently, we know this because we studied this uh, last night, they're going to come back and they're going to be giving false representations of things to do. Well, what are these false things that they're going to do? Early writings, page 87. The saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obligated to maintain from scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils... Okay, I'm going to substitute that because we know what their definition is. Right? What is the spirits of devils? That's angels, right? So the angels will appear to them, professing to be beloved friends, that's the angels, and relatives. And notice what they declare. They declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed. Also other unscriptural doctrine. So 
Think about that in relationship to that great controversy quote where it talks about Satan faking his coming. He says, oh, you're blaspheming my name. Why are they blaspheming? Because they're not listening to all their dead friends and relatives that have come back to them that I sent out of love. I love you. I sent your whoever, fill in the blank of whoever you love the most that has passed away. I sent them to you with love to tell you these things. And we also know from yesterday's, we're not going to go into that, they work miracles to, to show that they're from heaven and all these things. But they do these things to tell them that the Sabbath has changed, which is exactly what Satan said. Those angels are telling them the Sabbath has been changed. So that's where this comes from. So what do we have in this cadence of things? We have destruction coming. We have evil angels pretending to be dead friends and relatives that are angels. And they're telling us, hey, this destruction, this is bad. The Sabbath has been changed. That's why all this is happening. Imagine the pressure on people. How hard is it when everyone doesn't like you because of this? And on top of all of that, because this says saints, so I'm going to, these people are saved. They know the state of the dead, right? And they are going to have their loved one appear before them. Maybe it's a husband, a child that has passed away, a parent, whatever. And that person, they're going to look exactly like they, they're supposed to. They're going to look, the, the, the mannerisms, everything works. They work miracles, and they try to tell you that you need to stop what you're doing and follow the world's dictates. How much of a how difficult will it be to hold on? You've got to be grounded. And that's the point of this week of prayer is being grounded, building that relationship with Christ now because in this time, this is tough. This is very, very difficult. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, Great Controversy, page 590. The miracle working power manifested through spiritualism will exert its influence against those who choose to obey God's rather than men. Communications from the spirits, i.e. angels, will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. They will lament the great wickedness in the world and second the testimony of religious teachers that that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. That is very powerful. Now, this particular paragraph is happening after the Sunday law because it says they're affirming the laws, but you get the general idea. This is going on also prior to. They are telling you, look, this destruction that's happening is because you guys keep not following what we tell you to do, and they're so sad about it. They lament. And, and, and I, this, this last sentence Great will be the indignation, indignation against, excited against those, all of those who refuse to accept their testimony. That shows you. I mean, think about it. Think about someone who, who's, who doesn't know the truth, whose relatives have died in some disaster or something like that, and they have now come back to them. And we'll use the question that was asked. They, they made them sick and then healed them from their sick, or they were sick for real and they got healed. It doesn't matter. And they tell them, look, the reason this happened is because you are not, these people over here, that group over there is not following what God wants them to do. And if they would stop, all these good things would happen. But he can't bless you. He's got to send all these punishments to you because you refuse to listen. These other group is causing the problem, right? It's that separation of the groups, right? You have to make a choice. You're having to make a decision about what will happen and how you're going to make your life. And I can't imagine, again, if you're not connected to God, it's going to be very difficult to pull away from that. It is only through the mercy of God and through the power of His Spirit that we get through this. A lot of times, um, you know, people get scared of the end-time events because they think, 
I have to do this. I have to overcome this. I have to do all these things. And we associate it in me by myself. But praise God that there's a mighty Savior that has have all these powers that are able to help us and hold us if we are faithful. And that is a, uh, a big help in these times because these are going to be bad. All the destruction, all the spiritualism. And we read about the other stuff yesterday, but it's bear worth repeating. The deities appearing, the miracles being wrought, all these things happening, and this is what's going on. Manuscripts release, uh, volume 21, 325 through 326. I edited this down to shrink it uh, to hit the top parts. I would strongly recommend reading the entire vision, but uh, this is what it says. Friday night, several heard my voice exclaiming, look, look, whether I was dreaming or in a vision, I, I cannot tell. I slept alone. The time of trouble was upon us. So this is further down the timeline. I saw our people in great distress, weeping and praying, pleading the sure promises of God, while the wicked were all around us, mocking us and threatening to destroy us. They declared that they have the truth. Now pay attention to why they had the truth, that miracles were among them. Well, we've heard that before. That angels, well, we know who they are, from heaven have talked with them and walked with them. That great power and signs and wonders, miracles, were performed among them. That this was the temporal millennium they had been long expecting. The angels from heaven have spoken to us, referring to those whom Satan personated that had died and have claimed to have gone to heaven. You will hear the testimony of the heavenly messengers. They sneered, they mocked, they derided, and abused the sorrowing ones. That is powerful. And this shows the delusion that will happen I mean, look at what they're saying. The angels from heaven have spoken to us. So these, these manifestations of our dead friends are not necessarily going to be like what you hear about today, where you hear about some older person whose relative had passed away and they talk to each other periodically or they do the dishes or something like that. They're claiming to be from heaven. I almost imagine them glorified, you know, in some manner or form to kind of validate that thought process. They're saying they came from heaven, and they're saying it's your fault. We need to be connected to Christ because this is a very powerful thing to have to go through and be able to stand up against all of these things. Um, and the sad thing about this is the churches as a whole are open to this kind of deception. This is a, a, a Protestant magazine. My advice is to keep a lookout for angels. Look for angels in the form of loved ones who have died. Well, doesn't that just set you up for deception? This is a, a Catholic uh, magazine, Our Sunday Visitor. Since the days of Old Testament, the holy dead have been sent to the earth as God's celestial carriers. So you see Protestant and Catholic joining hands in this, this deception of the dead coming back and, and, and giving us special messages. And again, think about this. How hard is it to convince someone uh, uh, that, hey, read this Bible. This Bible says, do this when you have all this stuff going on, they're working miracles. They're, the apostles are coming back. I remember from last night, the apostles are coming back and telling you these things are not true. It's misquoted, whatever, however the excuse they're going to use. They're setting themselves up for this. So <clears throat> we want to look at what is some advice to be given, okay? This is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9. Uh, 232, 233. The light has been given me by the Lord at, this at a time when we were expecting just such a crisis as you seem to be approaching, uh, was that when the people, are uh, people were moved by a power from beneath to enforce Sunday observance, Seventh-day Adventists were to show their wisdom by refraining from their ordinary work on that day, devoting it to missionary effort. To defy the Sabbath laws will but strengthen the pro uh, in their persecution the religious zealots who are seeking seeking to enforce them. Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers. Keep right on with your missionary work, with your Bibles in hand, and the enemy 
will see that he has worsened his own cause. Now, <clears throat> well, actually, the next quote ties into this as well. It's a continuation, so we'll read that as well. Testimonies to the church, this is, a, this is actually right in the same page as volume 9, 232, 233. Sunday can be used for a carrying forward of various lines of work that will accomplish much for the Lord. On this day, open-air meetings and cottage meetings can be held. House-to-house -house work can be done. Those who write uh, can devote this day to writing their articles. Whenever it possible, let religious services be held on Sunday. Make these meetings intensely interesting, sing genuine revival hymns, and speak with power and assurance of the Savior's love. Speak on temperance and the true religious experience. You will thus learn much about how to work and will reach many souls. So I can just imagine this going on, you know, in my mind's eye as I read this, I, I, I imagine the Sunday law happening and, and every Adventist church open on Sunday for a Mark of the Beast and, and a religious seminar, a revelation seminar going through those things. How powerful would that be at the time when that, that kind of stuff happens? Now, also in here, she's speaking of using your head when these bad things happen. Do not antagonize. Is all of that stuff that they talked about of enforcing Sunday, is that a violation of the Constitution and your rights to religious free speech and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. Is telling you you can't work on Sunday absolutely not something that the government really should be able to do? Absolutely. But she's saying, use your head. Don't antagonize them. Even though it's a violation of your rights, just go along with it. This is about God and Satan this is not, you have bigger issues than this issue. And this is something that happened, I think I mentioned it before, but if you go online, you can actually find pictures of, of Adventist preachers in chain gangs because they refuse to not work on Sabbath and things of that nature. Um, before we move past this, though, I do want to mention, because uh, this is actually a quote that's utilized in a thought process of that there's four stages to the Sunday law and things of that nature. Um, I don't know uh, that that is necessarily the case. I mean, could there be? I know there's at least a few because there's no buy, no sell in the death decree. Um, they utilize this because it talks about not working on Sunday. Um, the issue with that is she's writing to people and she's also talking at a time when there's lots of blue laws going on and things of that nature. So I do think it's pertinent to us. The issue I would have with this is... There's an assumption, I think, sometimes with the Sunday law that there's nothing before it. Like there's, you're perfectly fine, and then all of a sudden one day you wake up and there's a Sunday law. I don't expect that at all. I actually expect the opposite. I expect because these disasters are happening. Remember, think about what's going on. You have disasters happening around the world. Cities are being destroyed. What's going to happen in that state when a city gets destroyed in a particular state and dead people come back to life and, and tell them that it's law-breaking, they're not worshiping God or properly. What will happen in that state? Oh, a blue law, right? A Sunday law will happen. And it'll pick up every other place and all these kind of things until you have a popular movement to create a national Sunday law. That's certainly also plausible. So I don't know, and then also here that doesn't mention anything that there could be fines and other stuff. So I understand the thought process. I just don't know that I can base that on one, uh, on this kind of quote. So anyway, um, this is going to be a time when we need to use our minds and really think about what's going on in, in the world and have our steps be cautious uh, because um, Satan will use opportunities to put us in hard places. That's also something that, that, that says further down on this particular quote if you actually go to and read the whole story there. Uh, Manuscripts Release, Volume 2. The time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work but will try to force men to labor on Sabbath. And men will be asked to renounce the Sabbath and subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their freedom and their lives. So not only is it not a work on Sunday, because you can not work on Sunday, that's not, that doesn't do anything. Um, but it is also a, a you must give up the Sabbath, which this hurts a lot of the idea of, of global warming being a, the thing that, that is the big mover behind this. I'm not saying it can't be a part of it or whatnot, but I would think Seventh-day Adventists who don't work on Sabbath and don't work on Sunday would be probably in the good side of 
the people if they were thinking global warming was the cause of it. So, but this, is, this says differently. It says, not only do you not work on Sabbath, you must renounce, uh, you, are you, not only do you not work on Sunday, but you must renounce the Sabbath. And then notice what uh, Satan himself says. This is uh, Patriarchs, uh, our prophets and kings, excuse me, page 184. This is Satan's words. Through the non-observance of the Sabbath that God instituted, I will bring his law into contempt, a sign between me and you throughout your generations, I will make to serve on the side of the Sabbath, on my Sabbath, excuse me. Thus the world will become mine. I will be the ruler of the earth, the prince of the world. I will so control the minds under my power that God's Sabbath shall be a special object of contempt, a sign. I will make the observance of the seventh day a sign of disloyalty to the authorities of the earth. Human laws will be made so stringent that men and women will dare not observe the Sabbath, seventh day Sabbath for fear of wanting food and clothing. They will join the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion. So that is Satan's plan, is to make it so miserable for you that you will give up your conscience, give up what you know is right, and side on his side to be lost. So when we look at our chart and we look at things going on, we see clearly that there is destruction in the cities and a rise of, of spiritualism that occurs prior to the Sunday law. And so the National Sunday Law comes somewhere there. Obviously, the gaps and spaces are relative and not really accurate. But Jesus just get the idea. And of course, the spiritualism and destruction of the cities carries on uh, forward from there. So uh, tomorrow night, we will be continuing the series. And again, 7 o'clock. So for those that, that, uh, that want to know the time... And so I encourage you to continue to come because these things build upon each other and it's really a story of the end of time. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for allowing us to come together and experience your joy by being in fellowship with you and learning about you and what you have to say about the closing moments of earth's history. Give us your spirit that we may have strength to endure and so that we may remain faithful in you and come soon quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if you have any questions or whatnot, you can feel free to come up. And there's the charts and, and things as well.